Good morning and a warm welcome to another virtual session of the U3A here in Hermanus. I am particularly excited to be able to welcome Stefan Pretorius all the way from London. This is the second time that he has addressed us. On previous occasions during his, his visits here, I tried to arrange a meeting in the hall, which was not possible. So this world of technology that he lives in has now come to our rescue as well. Stefan is the Chief Technology Officer of WPP, the largest advertising company in the world. He's had a career in technology. He was even the development manager of MNET here in South Africa at one stage. So this wonderful world we're going into, sometimes concerning and scary, which is what you live with. And I am sure you're going to give us some wonderful insights into this amazing world. Stefan, thank you for your time, and we're really looking forward to your presentation. Wonderful. Thank you, Gert. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be um, back um, in Armanus, at least virtually. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, I spoke to you about the, the impact of technology on, <clears throat> on work, life, and, uh, and personal relationships under COVID. Um, this morning, I'm going to talk to you about a, a much longer-term project um, for me, which is around artificial intelligence. And, and particularly within the context of WPP, the, um, the relationship of artificial intelligence with creativity. We're a at heart, a, a, create, a creative business, a, a business that, that sells the output of creative processes. Um, and so, you know, as I'm thinking about the impact of technology on those processes and how we can um, use things like artificial intelligence, it's, um, it's really been a, a fascinating journey the last couple of years for me to, um, to delve into. Um, I think a lot of you would have come across artificial intelligence in the context of science fiction, maybe. Um, there's, <clears throat> over the years, been many depictions of sort of sentient androids that take over the world, you know, all the way from Terminator to, um, to something more innocuous like her. Um, artificial intelligence has really been in a part of, of popular culture for many years. Um, but I think, as you'll see today, there are many ways in which artificial intelligence is already part of our lives. Um, many of us don't even think about it as AI anymore. We just think about it as what your phone can do. Um, but there's a very specific focus that I want to give today about whether artificial intelligence can impact creativity, whether it can be creative and to what extent. So um, I'm not going to talk about the whole field. That's impossible in an hour in any case. I'm not going to talk about artificial general intelligence, which is this idea of when are machines going to be so intelligent that they can be autonomous. Um, that's a, a, an entirely different book. Um, I'm going to focus on a, a far narrower topic about AI and creativity. It is worthwhile, though, just to pause for a second, just to um, give a little bit of a... Um, so if I answer my slide, um, a little bit of a, um, a definition of AI, um, which is just to kind of level set the, um, the discussion. So, so really AI is a quite a broad field of computer science that has to do um, with um, programming machines to do things which are normally associated with human um, behavior. And it's things like learning, problem solving, pattern recognition. And, and many of these things um, today um, manifest themselves in things like natural language understanding. So you can speak into your phone and your phone can translate that, those words, that, that sound file into text and then understand the text and then act on the text. Um, this idea of text to speech, so you can write something on your computer and then the computer can speak it back to you. Um, a, a field that has been really, really fast growing is this idea of visual search and image recognition. So being able to understand programmatically what is in an image and not just an image, but also a video. So is it a person, is it a dog, is it a tree, with what levels of confidence, et cetera. And then the, the very big field around machine learning, of which deep learning, I guess, is a, a sort of an evolution, um, which has really got to do with this idea of, of machines iteratively solving problems by themselves. Um, and really all, all of this works on doing things many, many times over until you get to um, the correct outcome. So, so the first question before we get to creativity is can machines be intelligent? And, and I think the, here it's, it's, it's often um, an emotional question or a question that people have opinions about, but I think one has to define intelligence quite narrowly. And I, I like this, this idea of um, the capacity to do the right thing at the right time, which comes from um, you know, a 19th century um, text about intelligence. Um, and it's, it's this ability to respond to opportunities and challenges presented by a context. Right? So it's quite a narrow definition of what intelligence is. Um, and I would say in that, um, in that sense, 
machines are definitely uh, intelligent today. So many of you would have followed the the very famous um, AlphaGo versus Lisa Dole um, AlphaGo um, competition. So Go is a is a board game, Chinese board game that is um, uh, said to be infinitely more complicated than chess. Um, <clears throat> and um, and the uh, a bunch of machine learning experts here in London working for Google programmed a machine called AlphaGo to play Go against um, the world champion and 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 beat him and beat him quite um, quite significantly. And what's interesting about this is that um, if you think about the the deep blue the IBM Gary Kasparov chess ch uh, championships a couple of years ago, um, what happened in the in the chess tournament is that. Um, the, the IBM computer was programmed with all past chess moves and chess games that had ever been played and learned effectively how a normal person would learn if you learned chess from a book. Um, in the case of AlphaGo, AlphaGo was given no rules whatsoever. It was given no previous competitions. But what they did is they let AlphaGo play against itself millions and millions and millions of times before they played. Uh, it played against Lisa Dole. And so what's interesting about that is that um, this is the, the first case of an incredibly complicated large-scale machine learning model that actually beat a human without any, any kind of pre-training happening as they did with the, the Kasparov um, uh, you know, chess competition in the past. Um, and and this, this kind of method of, of machine learning, iterative problem solving over and over again, is exactly what's being applied today in many different fields of our lives. So facial recognition um, is maybe not something that is widely used in South Africa yet, um, but in many big cities in the world, including London and certainly in China and the East, facial recognition cameras um, in streets, in suburbs, has become a, a, a sort of a normal, a normal factor. And you would have seen during the Hong Kong riots recently, <clears throat> the, um, the, the protesters using, um, you know, kind of uh, obfuscating devices, masks that have, you know, lights on them or lasers, whatever the case might be, to confuse the, um, the facial recognition cameras. Um, but still, these cameras have become incredibly powerful and accurate, um, often able to identify up to 20,000 people in a crowd at the same time. Um, so that's one application, and you can say that's scary, or that's that's good for for public order. Um, you know, everyone has their opinion about it, but I think it's a it's it's really a it's an interesting computing challenge that has been solved. Um, computers are being used to um, to you know, uh, for instance, in Overwatch, is a famous computer game, to play against humans and to to learn how to beat them. Um, there are many devices these days that help us translate on the fly. Um, we're using machine learning technology and radiology for things like cancer detection. Um, and there's and there's obviously an enormous amount of, um, of machine learning that happens in self-driving cars, autonomous cars, which is fast becoming a reality too. So these things are, are sort of infiltrating our lives, you know, quite, um, quite comprehensively, you know, to an extent that I don't think everyone always um, appreciates. But, but the question for today is really not about can machines be intelligent, it's about can machines be creative. And so I'll, I'll start with a slightly less ambitious um, first question, which is can machines create? Now, um, I'm going to give you all, well, let me give you some background first. So um, uh, a couple of years ago, um, Microsoft and a number of the, um, the big technology companies in Silicon Valley um, set up a, a research um, institution called OpenAI. And OpenAI um, is essentially a bunch of very smart um, uh, you know, computer scientists who are working on ways to improve the, the value, quality, and reliability of artificial intelligence um, computing. And, and, and um, OpenAI started publishing a very large, um, what they call the language transformer model. Um, they they um, collected and, and, uh, and indexed an enormous amount of of text from, from sources on the internet, um, and then built a language transformer that can effectively write text or copy um, um, based on previous inputs in the same style and with the same level of fidelity. Now, famously last year, um, the, the second version of this language transformer, it was called GPT-2, um, uh, was used to to generate some text in a, in a long article that the New Yorker published about this topic. And I've, I've put the, the link to the, um, to the article in there for all of you to, to read at your, at your leisure. It's a nice 20 page long New Yorker article, but absolutely fascinating. But I, I wanted to, to just give you this piece of text um, 
And I'm going to quickly read it just um, and, and forgive me for, for being, um, you know, sort of comprehensive about this, but I think it's quite interesting to, um, to look at it as an example. So this is a piece of text that was written by Steven Pinker, um, the famous historian. And um, part of it was written by Steven Pinker and part of it was not. And the, the, the trick in this exercise is to figure out which part was written by him and which part was written by um, the machine, right? So this is how, how it reads. Being amnesic for how it began a phrase or sentence, it won't consistently complete with it, um, the necessary agreement and concord. To say nothing of semantic coherence, he's talking about the machine. And this reveals the second problem. Real language does not consist of a running monologue that sounds sort of like English. It's a way of expressing ideas, a mapping from meaning to sound or text. To put it crudely, speaking or writing is a box whose input is a meaning plus a communicative intent and whose output is a string of words. Comprehension is a box with the opposite information flow. What is essentially wrong with this perspective is that it assumes that meaning and intent are inextricably linked. Their separation, the learning scientist Phil Zuckerman has argued, is an illusion that we have built into our brains, a false sense of coherence. All right, so fairly complicated piece of text, um, you know, sophisticated um, sentence structure, quite sophisticated language use, um, vocabulary, etc. And you can ask, I'm not gonna ask for, for suggestions because we'll be here all afternoon, but um, what, just think for yourself, draw a line, draw a, a red line somewhere in that paragraph of what you think Steven Pinker wrote and what you think the machine wrote. The answer is there. Steven Pinker wrote everything up to the red line and everything beyond that was written by GPT-2. Now, what's fascinating about this is that no one, not even historians or computer scientists, could actually distinguish that point. Everyone got it wrong. Okay? So, in a sense, this illustrates the sophistication of language generation and the degree to which this has become, um, in a way, it's, it's surpassed the level where humans can detect that it's written by a machine. Right, so um, that's one, one stake in the ground. The second one is this. Um, none of these people that you see here are real. These are all machine generated faces. And this was generated from a, um, a database of celebrities and recompiled into new celebrities. Um, so you might think that some of these people look slightly strange or that the, the lighting is slightly odd, but you probably wouldn't look twice if you saw these people in a magazine. All these people were generated by machines. And again, I've posted there the, the link to the, um, the academic article that shows how this was done. At WPP, we've also been working a lot with this, um, this technique um, and sort of exploring different uh, you know, ways of, of using it practically in our work. Um, this is a wonderful project that we've been working on with Microsoft um, and NVIDIA. Um, and Microsoft is bringing out, um, at the moment, a, a new dual screen computing device. So effectively, instead of just a, you might've seen Samsung do the ones that kind of completely flip open and it's one screen, the Microsoft one actually has two screens, but they are connected. And, and we started experimenting with this device um, <clears throat> and using a technique called style transfer and semantic mapping in order to help us create new content. And, and what you're seeing here is, is basically um, on the, on the left-hand side, someone using, you know, kind of very crudely, um, you know, sort of a computer pencil to, to draw a semantic map. So it's just an outline, a shape. And then the machine generates a new image, in this case of a Scarlet Macaw, trained on um, a data set of 20,000 um, Scarlet Macaws that we found on the internet and put in a big database. Now, what's fascinating about this is that you can effectively create um, any shape on the, on the left-hand side, you can make it square and it'll square parrot. Um, but, but as you can clearly see, if you start using templates or outlines that, that look generally like parrots, you actually mm. have ideas or very interesting execution. No, I, um, unmute my audio. Can we just go on mute? I can hear some talking in the background. Thank you. Um, now, what's interesting about this process is that clearly you have you run this over and over again and, until you get results that are really beautiful. What is extremely difficult in, in this model, even with enormously powerful computers, are the eyes. The eyes are the hardest thing for the machine to get right. Um, and often these parrots come out without eyes, um, which is obviously a failure. Um, but as you can see, when it gets it right, these are actually very artistic and extremely interesting portraits um, that have effectively been generated, you know, um, 
by a machine based on the training data set. Um, it also gets more sophisticated. Um, this is a Rembrandt. This is a close-up of, of a Rembrandt painting of, of the eyes and the nose of a self-portrait. Um, just, it's not painted by Rembrandt. This was painted by a machine um, using exactly the same technique as we used for the Scarlet McCall project based on a training data set of all the Rembrandts that have been painted before. We then did feature analysis of all the different features like the eyes, the noses, the clothing, etc. And we generated a brand new Rembrandt based on a, um, a portrait photograph of a person. Um, and what we then uh, did one step further is we then printed this portrait in high resolution with 3D printers to give it not only um, you know, the right color and everything else, but also the right texture and topography on the actual canvas. And the result was um, a project that we called the Next Rembrandt. It's a, a project commissioned by the Dutch bank ING. Um, and, and it is really um, extremely compelling. Um, I mean, even, even sophisticated art experts would have to look twice to realize that this is not a Rembrandt, or frankly, they would recognize that it's not one that they know. Um, this work is also then you know, used, um, particularly in the last couple of months, very effectively for us to, to help generate new content or content that um, you know, we can't afford to have models in studios forever. We can't you know, get people together for photo shoots. Um, and so what you do is you take an existing model and you essentially do a style transfer with different clothing operations and, and combinations in order to get an entire catalog, for instance, for um, a clothing brand at a fraction of the cost and time that would normally take. Um, and, and this work obviously goes beyond just still images. This is an example of Synthesia. It's a business we work with that does um, uh, effectively what they call synthetic people, also known as deep fakes. Um, but synthetic people is really the ability to, to style transfer, you know, the person on the, cam on the photograph on, or the camera on the, on the right um, is the one speaking and the person on the, on the left is the, um, the target. And effectively she's saying words that she would never have said or haven't said personally, um, those words are being imposed on her by the, the style transfer. Right, so all this gets really exciting and very uh, potentially scary as you get into this point, because clearly um, you can have Donald Trump say um, he's Democrat and um, you know people would believe it if you use this kind of technique. Um, it's also being used by, by artists, by fine artists, and there's an entire field of, of AI art. Um, I posted on that link there a, a reference for you to have a look at of um, 25 of the top AI artists working today. This is a, um, a simulation done by Christian Leclerc, who's a French um, AI artist. Um, and, and what's really interesting about these things is that, um, uh, similarly to the one that you, that you saw in the, in the title slide, all these AI artists are using um, artificial intelligence to augment their creativity, to, to generate possibilities and outcomes that they couldn't generate or didn't think about themselves, um, you know, specifically and precisely, um, but had a sort of general idea of what they wanted to achieve. And so in this way, and I think particularly in, in, the, in the field of art, artificial intelligence is very much a, an augmenter of creativity or it's seen as a, as a, as a creative partner to the, the artist as opposed to being something that is generating by itself. All right, um, so, but all of this can obviously be, um, you know, become quite scary as, as I think a lot of you saw in those, those examples. Um, you know, once you start, once you can start making people say words that they didn't say, once you can make someone speak Chinese who has never learned Chinese, um, these things become quite um, complicated from a, a policy and kind of um, ethics perspective. And so um, a book that I would highly recommend um, for all of us to read um, is Tools and Weapons by Brad Smith. Brad Smith is the, um, the president of Microsoft. He was the, um, the general counsel of Microsoft for many years. Um, and and I've, I found this a particularly thoughtful book about the, the way that technology can be both a tool, but also a weapon and how technology can be weaponized if it is not um, responsibly used. And the, the point that, that Brad makes in this book is really that, that um, as these new technologies come to the fore, um, the considerations around fairness, transparency, ethics um, are absolutely primary. And we have to think about the implication of these technologies before we start releasing them into the, into the wild. Now, the two areas that, that I've been focusing on a lot in the last year um, is firstly this idea of synthetic diversity. And again, None of the faces you see on the screen are real people. These are all machine generated images. 
And the, the, the point of the, the research work we're doing here is to basically understand, um, firstly, you know, is it, how, how, how does um, diversity, ethnic, racial, age diversity in commercial advertising impact consumers? Um, secondly, um, what is the response of consumers to synthetic diversity? In other words, you know, you have one model um, that might be a Chinese girl, and then suddenly from that model you create a white girl, a black girl, and you know, and a white man. Um, you put all those those models in the in the ads or versions of the ads, um, and how do how do consumers respond to that? And then and then lastly, um, the sort of whole ethical discussion and, and debate about is it correct to do that? Is it better to have synthetic diversity than no diversity? Is the representation more important than the reality? Um, and frankly, is it unethical to, to create a black model from a white model and not pay her modeling fees um, or vice versa um, than not to have any diversity in your ads? Now, I'm not gonna <laughs> try and answer all those questions in, in, this, in this talk, but as you can see, um, the, uh, this is an incredibly complicated area. Uh, I'll give you some, some quick, quick shorthand. Um, one, um, ethnically targeting or, or uh, you know, pro racially and gender profiling consumers in, in advertising works. People like seeing people that look like them and feel like them in ads. So unfortunately that works. The second thing is that um, the synthetic diversity is, um, has, has no negative impact whatsoever. So whether it's a real, per a real model or a, or a generated model has no difference in terms of how consumers respond. And the third answer is that we are not doing this because we are finding it too dangerous and too um, morally complicated at the moment. So this is R&D, we are not putting it into the wild. And, and part of the reason is this, right? So it's this idea of bias and, and um, homophily, which is this idea of people gravitating towards themselves or to things that look like them or feel familiar. Now, um, it, I'm gonna play the animation on the left. What's happening here is that um, these two subjects, um, and those are profile images of themselves at the bottom, um, were asked to cons consistently say, who do, I, um, who do I approve of more or who do I want to be more, um, given a number of different, um, you know, sort of uh, pictures of, of other women. And what you find consistently when you do these, these experiments is that people gravitate to people that look like them. So the end result um, is the match, which is now static there. The blonde girl likes, you know, the, the image of the blonde girl, the Asian girl likes the image of the Asian girl. And, and you might say that this is a natural human phenomenon, um, but it does reinforce this whole idea of, of um, consciousness bubbles and, you know, that, that Facebook, for instance, at the moment is being so, so deeply criticized for. It also can get people into trouble. So Netflix um, uh, last year did an experiment where they um, they essentially automatically created trailers for programs that were different depending on the the the, the, the ethnicity of the viewers. So if you were a white subscriber, you would see one version of the Like Father trailer. If you were a black subscriber, you would see a different one. And the reality was that um, that particular program didn't actually feature um, a black family or couple as the as the the leading um, the leading people in the storyline. It was very much a kind of a marginal or secondary part of the storyline. Um, and when this came out, Netflix was incredibly um, you know criticised for this and um, and taken to task for being so duplicitous. So as you can see, I mean you know, these kind of applications, they might be possible, um, but just because we can do it doesn't mean we should do it. All right, so, um, but this, this now still doesn't leave us to the, um, the central question of can machines be um, creative? Um, I've shown you that they can be intelligent, I've shown you that they can create, um, but can they be creative? And, and, and so, uh, again, I think it's useful to kind of to think about these things in a slightly more structured way. And, and, and probably the most useful definition of creativity that I've read recently um, is by the um, psychologist Mihaly um, Csikszentmihalyi. Um, he famously wrote a book recently called Flow, um, which was very popular, uh, particularly in sort of technology circles, He's an American, American um, psychologist. But in 1996, he wrote a book called Creativity, the Psychology of Discovery and Invention. And, and his definition of creativity is, um, it's any act, idea, or product that changes an existing domain or that transform an existing domain into a new one. 
So, so he basically has the sort of model where he says there are three um, sort of, I guess, actors in a creative process. There's the person that, that does the creating, there's the, there's the domain. So mathematics is a domain, you know, painting can be a domain, um, computer science can be a domain. And the domain has a preset, um, uh, you know, sort of set of, of codes and um, some symbolic language, et cetera, that is, that is effectively the, the kind of foundation for, for that, you, that you create within. Um, and then there's the field, which is all the people that, have, um, that function or operate and are experts in that field that, um, that collectively decide whether something is novel or something you know, changes the domain or brings it forward. So he very much has this idea that that creativity writ large, not small c. I mean, my three-year-old daughter was creative. Um, or he still is, but um, in the sense of, of being truly impactful in terms of changing a domain um, or, um, or redefining a domain, I think it's a very, um, it's a very ambitious and very kind of, you know, large uh, concept. And so in order to be truly creative, then one has to be able to encode an entire domain. One has to be able to um, get feedback and, and response from an entire field of experts. Um, and so it really much becomes a social model as opposed to a mathematical process. And, and I would say the great thing, and this is sort of where the, the story becomes a good news story, is that um, as far as I can tell, um, and all the work I've been doing in this field, artificial, artificial intelligence today um, and technology in general um, has no social code. There's no, there's no way that we can encode everything um, that happens in society and the, the entire fabric of, of a domain or all the experts within it um, in a way that can actually give machines sense of a social code. So work like this, um, this is the, the famous Colin Kaepernick um, campaign that Nike supported. This is a, um, an American football player who famously um, knelt and, um, and did the Black Power salute during a, a football game and was heavily criticized by Trump. Um, the fact that Nike would take that that social action, that sort of that protest, that sort of sense of protest, and and grab onto it as a, a brand ideal of people who buy Nike clothing, and then support that very boldly because it was incredibly criticised by by the um, by the Republicans in the US, um, is something that would never happen by a machine. A machine would never say, take a protest at a football game and make that a, um, a, a, a sort of a campaign attached to a clothing brand. There's no, there's no logic, there's no pre-existing model for that. There's no training data set that you can use in order to, um, to do that. You also can't do this. <clears throat> this is a Sport England campaign we did um, for, to encourage women to, to be more active in the UK and to, um, to exercise. And this entire campaign looks like this, effectively unglamorous, dirty, wet, um, you know, largely normal people, <laughs> not glamorized, not supermodels doing sport. Everything from playing rugby to, you know, running um, your dog in the mud and whatever the case is. So this is, again, something which if you look at the, tr the training data sets of or training, portraying women in, in sport, the machine would never generate it because there is no model for this. And there is no social, there's no social code that the machine could tap into that said, sometimes doing the opposite, sometimes showing what's real or not what is seen as the ideal is more effective than doing something obvious. It also can't do this. It can't put, you know, Donald Trump's head on a bus and, and make his eyes go round and round, um, which is very comedic. Um, but again, you know, until you do it, um, there's no model for it. It also can't do this. This is a Burger King restaurant in the US that um, legitimately burned down accidentally, um, <clears throat> but our, our ad agency in, in, the, in Miami who work for Burger King took this photograph <clears throat> and made it into a campaign um, around being flame grilled. And the whole idea was that the restaurant could only burn, burn down if there were real flames in the restaurant. So, the, <laughs> and this became something which was kind of quite a big part of the, the ad campaign, um, the idea that, that Burger King uses real flames and not just, you know, kind of heat grills like McDonald's. Um, again, making a connection between something which is a tragedy and something, a one-off event, um, and creating a, a social, uh, you know, sort of social commentary about, about that event. And it certainly would have done this. So this is a, um, this is a mock up before a campaign that actually never ran. Um, but we, we were tasked by Bird's Eye, um, it's a fish finger brand here in the UK, um, to effectively reinvigorate the brand. 
and one of our creative teams <laughs> came up with this, this sort of sketch as a, as a sort of a, um, uh, you know, um, a, a bit of a challenge or a bit of a kind of um, a creative challenge for themselves, which is if it's not fish fingers for tea, your parents don't love you, <laughs> and trying to sort of reinvigorate the the um, um, the campaign or the idea of the sort of you know um, sea sea captain, the sort of um, you know fishing captain as the uh, um, as the icon for the for the brand. Um, this didn't run, but um, this did run. So um, the the one on the left is the is the the sort of iconic um, bird's eye captain that was on the on the boxes and uh, you know many sort of English families got to know over the years um, and really kind of the key insight was that it's not children who buy fish fingers it's mothers who buy fish fingers and mothers don't want to buy fish fingers from the guy on the left they want to buy fish fingers from the guy on the right he's actually not English he's a very good looking um, uh, Italian model <laughs> and um, and when we started using um, the Italian model in the in the fish finger campaigns and on the the packaging um, it became so popular that eventually we had to create a Christmas um, calendar with captain with the bird's eye captain that sold out almost within a week now all these things I mean I'm being slightly um, cheeky about these examples but you know the, the point I'm trying to make is that um, it is impossible for machines, and I think for a very long time, um, and I can't actually see a future where it is, it is, it is even possible, to be able to make um, the kind of connections that all this creativity that I've shown you here, and this is obviously within a very narrow field of advertising, um, has been able to produce. Um, and so I'm, I am you know, incredibly um, uh, relaxed and, and not worried about whether machines can be creative. I know they can be intelligent, and I know they can be useful in that way. I know they can help us create and they can help us um, automate certain, you know, creative processes, but can they be truly creative in the sense of, of creating new social codes? Not today and certainly not during my lifetime. Um, they also can't do this. And this is something which is completely contrary to the, um, the, the whole direction of, of what we're using machines for in advertising which is a campaign by Dove um, called Real Beauty, um, which was about the idea of taking models back from being photoshopped and, and sort of, you know, done up and taking them back to what they really looked like and, um, and using this idea of real beauty as, their, as the core of their campaign. And so as much as we use artificial intelligence to, to do things like this, to make models look, you know, presumably prettier, um, there's a very big backlash now um, to... Um, a set of, of technologies and tools that help us identify fake news, fake images, um, you know, photoshopped images, um, and, and to take those, that content out of our systems and out of our lexicon. And so all the large companies, Facebook, Google, um, Microsoft, all of these companies are today um, and have already actually invested in very large, what they call um, deep fake training data sets. In other words, they've created a whole bunch of deep fake images in order for us to be able to identify them when we see them in the wild. Um, and so I, I find this a really interesting kind of like um, back to the future kind of kind of moment where, you know, we're using the same techniques that, that got us, you know, to a point where there was a lot of fake um, content in the world and on the internet to a world where we are reversing it. Um, and so for me, it, it all comes back to this, this idea of intention um, and whether, whether you have an ethical or nefarious intention about how you use these technologies. So I'm sure I have a lot of a lot of comments and uh, and uh, questions for discussion, but I want to I want to just give um, uh, you know uh, one more example of machine generation before we end off. So um, at the very end of that same New York article that I quoted earlier, uh, the one with Steven Pinker, the um, the journalist asked this question, and I'll read this slowly just so we can sort of reflect on it. Uh, the journalist says. What if some much later iteration of GPT-2, this is the open AI um, uh, language generator, far more powerful than this model, could be hybridized with a procedural system so that it would be able to write causally and distinguish truth from fiction and at the same time draw from its well of deep learning. One can imagine a kind of Joycean super author capable of any style, turning out spine-tingling suspense novels, massively researched biographies, and nuanced analysis of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Humans would stop writing, or at least publishing, because all the readers would be captivated by the machines. What then? And the very spine-tingling response that when you feed this paragraph 
that I've just read into GPT-2, it responds with the following. It says, in a way, the humans would be making progress. So um, I'll leave you with that. And um, Gert, if you want to go back to the video, then we can open up for questions. It's a lot. <laughs> Still, thank you very much. How fascinating. I think if you can stop your sharing, we can look at your face, please. There you go. Excellent. Thank you very much. I've got a whole bunch of questions, but I'm sure other people have too. So I'm going to give anybody who wishes to open your microphone, ask a question, or raise your electronic hand, and I'll respond to that. Robin? I would like to pick up on a phrase that Stefan used uh, many times during his presentation. It's the phrase, in the wild. What struck me here, which meant, I assume, you make it public. Yeah. The implications of that are quite disturbing. Mm. Uh, the history of technology is mainly the history of human beings gaining dominance over the wild. We have been able to subdue the wild, turn it to our own purposes, and construct a society which is more predictable uh, deeper in its social context and preferable in many ways to the wild. What seems to be happening here is that the machines are programming us back into the wild as the public. We do not have the means to dis understand how we are being manipulated and gradually decreated by machines. And so a whole shift of us being tamed and the wild being what we have tamed is now one in which machines are taming us to take only the information which they provide. That seems to me to be the core of the ethical problem which you also often referred to. I'd like a comment on that please. No, it's a great question Roman and, and, and you know quite, quite, a, <laughs> quite, a, quite a broad um, quite, quite a broad one. I mean I would say I mean, the key, the key thing um, I sort of try to um, convey, and maybe not, maybe not as, as expressly in the, the discussion around intelligence, is that, you know, all of this AI is working within a, 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 a set of objectives set by people. So when, when, when the, the AlphaGo, um, you know, computer was, was trained, effectively it said, you win maximizing the number of black dots on the board. And you can do anything you want within these, this context. You can move one piece at a time. You can't jump, etc. So it gives you the kind of parameters, and it says this is, op, you know, sort of optimized for this objective. Um, and so that entire system, while intelligent, is because it's making the right decisions at the right time, is doing it within the context of a board game and a set of objectives and and um, and outcomes. Now, when um, when, for instance. Um, you know, uh, if you look at all the kind of the disinformation that, that happened um, during the 2016 election and probably it's happening right now during the current US election done by the Russians, um, the, the, the objective was um, make the American society more, um, more kind of um, divisive. In other words, you know, make, make the, the right-wing people, you know, and the, the, make, make the Democrats and the Republicans understand each other less and, and have more polarization in society. So that is a nefarious objective, um, but it's an objective set by a human. And and similarly, when we when we say, you know, create me a a new a new sort of you know uh, image of a, of a female model based on a training data set of twenty thousand female models, the outcome um, is dependent on two things. The one is the input that we, we choose, so the quality and the variety and the sort of and the range of data we give it, and then the and then the the stated objective. Now there's some very interesting kind of and, and, and so really for me the the to answer your question directly, the problem is not with the machines, the problem is with the objective set by human actors at the moment, by human people. Um, and and so, you know, and, and very often the you know, we are doing this research in order to understand um, before it becomes widely adopted and and sort of part of large-scale systems, what the impact will be. Um, 
And and for instance, if you um, there's a I mean we did some work recently around around um, around aging. So if we if we take a certain set of models and we then age them, um, you know what what is the is the result consistent and do they look credible, etc. And we used a a training data set of of an enormous number of facial images from from Flickr. If you remember that online photo sharing um, site, um, and we saw this very odd sort of anomaly, which is that if you age 20 year old men into 40 year old men and then 70 year old men, it all looks fine. It all looks completely credible. But women, as we age them using this training data set, ultimately started looking more and more like men. So all the 70 plus women look like men. And we couldn't really figure this out until we then went back and did a, um, an indexing of the, the training data set. And we found that um, in the Flickr database, there's a massive overrepresentation of young women and a massive underrepresentation of older women. So this is just the this is just the, the, the actual distribution in the data set, um, and as a result, the machine didn't have enough examples of older women in the training data set in order to age photographs accurately. So you know these these kinds of things um, and understanding the the entire input and output system, and then you know ethically setting the objectives is what it's it's ultimately what it's what it's about. I mean we are not even close or even you know. Uh, you know, even 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 the, we can't even see a reality right now, Robin, of of you know artificial general intelligence. In other words, machines that act autonomously and that make that initiate activities and decisions completely by themselves. Everything happens within within a construct of an input data set and a and an objective. So I think I mean you're right. I mean I mean you, I probably triggered a, a thought about. Um, the wild and how humans are not in control of, of their worlds anymore. Um, but I think we are. The, the reality is just that we, there are, there are, you know, there are people using technology in our societies and they can use those things either responsibly or, or irresponsibly. And that's sort of the point of the Brian Smith book, you know, Tools and Weapons. It's to really understand the role of not only governments, but also corporations in, um, in that ethical, um, you know, in that ethical process. I think, Stefan, that's a question that is on my mind. You've touched on the on ethics and what Brad Smith said in his book, but isn't this situation already out of control? I mean, the mere fact that a country like Russia wants to interfere in the elections in another country, isn't the system already out of control? No. Well, I, I mean, in fact, I, I would say that, you know, that's, that's not new, right? I mean, you know, you all lived through the Cold War and you know that, you know, all the, you know, underlying all the kind of the, the spy dramas and, 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 and books was really kind of, you know, um, it was all about misinformation, propaganda, um, you know, uh, interfering with other, with the running of, 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 of foreign governments, you know, um, you know, extra national assassinations, etc. I mean, so these, you know, this is sort of a, um, it, it's been a factor of geopolitical, um, you know, uh, relationships for, for the last, you know, sort of, you know, I guess since, since past the second world war, right. Um, the, the only difference today is that, is that you have slightly different tools. Right? And so, you know, the ability to, to influence, um, you know, what people read and what people, how people's minds change is really the point. So for, for those of you who have Netflix, there's a fantastic documentary running at the moment, social dilemma, which I would highly recommend you, you, you watch. Um, might might explain a lot of your your grandchildren's behavior <laughs> um but what 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 was fascinating for me about the the social dilemma there's there's a there's a wonderful um person featured in this who's by far my favorite um uh, you know kind of person in the documentary called Yaron Lanier and Yaron Lanier is this sort of very eccentric um you know sort of internet um theorist and and technologist i mean he came up with the world uh, with, the, with the, the the term virtual reality etc um but he he's just written a book called um 10 reasons why you need to delete all your social media profiles right now and and he um he's been on this crusade about this because he believes it to be a completely existential issue he believes the fact that social media reinforces negative behavior isolation um, anxiety separation between different points of view he sees all those things as being essentially um, an existential threat to the human race and I think I think in in, in that sense um, you know that is more about about the impact of social media on society than it is about artificial intelligence um, but I think the you know the point to some degree is is correct um, I mean I I think the uh, you know where we are today 
is that there is a um, an increasing amount of polarization and um, you know and sort of a lack of understanding between people and frankly um, you know trust in media or trust in journalism which is which is a you know sort of a topic we discussed last time as well this idea of post-truth and, and you know what happens when when no one has a common understanding of what happens I, I don't think that is necessarily though a a function of of AI it's more a function of how you know societies have adopted technology and how they've used it in order to communicate and spread ideas Ronnie Hazel who is online he and I discussed this movie just a week ago Ronnie you want to comment on this Or anybody else? Anybody else with a question or a comment? Thanks, thanks for the opportunity, Gert. Um, yeah, I found that that film very disturbing, and it, um, I've recommended it to all my grandchildren and my sons, etc., to get it to their grandchildren to look at it. But yeah, I, it's the whole thing is this has been a fascinating presentation. Thanks so much. Um, it's really opened my eyes to a whole lot of things that I wasn't aware of. Um, but I'm a little bit frightened about the future, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think, Ronnie, the, the, um, I mean, there's, there's something to be, there, there was, a, there was a, I forget now who, who, um, who came up with this quote, but, but someone asked, um, you know, should we be scared of artificial intelligence, or, or, you know, is AI going to take my job? I think was the specific question. Is, is AI going to take my job? And, um, and the answer um, that the, the, the interview gave was, is it, no, it's not AI that's going to take your job. It's the person who knows how to implement and use AI that will take your job. Um, and, and I think <laughs> that in, in a sense, you know, that, that's sort of my, for someone working in the field, I mean, that's sort of my, my sense of it is that the only way to understand the potential, guard against the, the dangers, um, embrace the opportunities is to actually, you know, educate yourself and become, um, you know, uh, sort of proficient at these things as opposed to just sort of, you know, um, being scared of them from a distance um, because it's, it's from within that you can make a difference. Um, you know, for instance, WPP and, and Microsoft have a, um, a very big work stream going on right now about creating, um, you know, ethically, ethically vetted training data sets for AI. So off the back of that work we did on the, the aging, um, we're now going into a, a, a very large program with them to, to build large databases that are properly um, unbiased, um, you know, properly representative, etc. Because the, 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 the fundamental problem is that, you know, most consumers and, and, and frankly, even most companies, don't have access or don't have the ability to, to, to reset the underlying data that builds these systems. So all you get is you get a, an interface that says, here's a, a video, a video kind of identification system. So upload a video tells you what's in the video, right? So you start using these things as a, you know, as sort of, you know, services as, as APIs and, um, and, and, and most companies don't even question what is the data underlying those systems in order to give you that result. And so, you know, uh, certainly our aim is to work with, with, with partners like, um, like Microsoft and things like that. We work with Google on the, on the deep fake database in order to, to be able to identify deep fakes. Um, and for instance, you know, for that um, Real Beauty campaign with, with, with Dove now, the, the, the next iteration of that campaign um, is to effectively use that, that data set we built with Google in order to identify images that have been, that have been manipulated. So, I mean, I think, I think that's sort of the, you know, it's a bit like, um, I don't know, 25 years ago when people said, you know, the internet's just, you know, a scary thing, what should be banned or what, I mean, it's, the message is never the medium, right? I mean, I don't think that's, that's the, that's the point. Um, it's about human intention. It's about, you know, what your objective is and making sure that there's the right level of incentives and disincentives in society for us to use this technology responsibly. Letitia, your microphone is open. Please, um, thank, thank you, uh, um, Stefan, it's been absolutely fascinating. Uh, I want just to ask you, uh, in terms of what human beings can do that machines uh, cannot, what role do you think something like imagination and intuition play? Yeah, I, I think, Letitia, I think, I think that, I mean, that's a great point. And I think there are many dimensions of human behavior that, that, that machines even can't, can't even begin to approximate at the moment. I mean, I think, um, you know, imagination is, I've, I've been saying for years, and my parents have heard me say this, is that I think imagination is becoming the, the most sought after skill set in business um, in the future. Um, because so many things that were previously technical or professional jobs, you know, can, can actually be done by machines quite successfully. I mean, computation, 
you know, for a long, long time, we've, we've kind of given up on machines on much better computation than we are. Um, but, but certainly, you know, many, many other technical fields from accounting to even, you know, contract law and regulation, et cetera, um, can to a large degree be, be done by machines in the future. So, you know, imagination is, is really um, one of the, the, the key um, differentiators. And I would encourage all of us to, you know, stimulate our children and grandchildren as much as we can in, this, in that area. Um, and certainly things like intuition or, you know, there, there's, a, there's, a famous, there's a famous kind of um, um, machine learning problem. So I, we spoke about, you know, um, facial recognition, um, and but this is a slightly different experiment. It's around the, it's called the, the noisy room experiment. And so if you're in a, for instance, a bar and it's extremely noisy, you know, imagine like a music playing, lots of people talking, etc. And someone walks into the bar and shouts your name, um, you will pick it up. And, and people do this kind of, you know, kind of quite consistently, unless they've got hearing, <laughs> hearing problems, but um, there, there's, humans have the ability to kind of to, um, to recognize their name in a crowded environment, which has got nothing to do with the decibel levels or the rest of the noise in, in that room. Now, if you, if you try to get a machine to, to replicate that, it is virtually impossible. It's sort of one of those things that machines just find incredibly hard to do. Um, and, uh, you know, there are other examples, for instance, the, um, in robotics, there's something called the squishiness test, which is the disability that humans have. If you line up five tomatoes on a, on a counter, and they're all the same size, but some are slightly softer than, than others, humans would pick up the really soft one in a different way. You'd sort of pick it up, you know, slightly from underneath. You would, you know, not, you know, sort of, you know, press it quite as hard. Um, this is the, the hardest thing for robot in, in robotics today to, to replicate. So a robot would simply say, it's that size, it's that kind of thing, and apply, apply a certain amount of pressure. There's no, there's the, the feedback loop on, on how to deal with squishiness um, is incredibly sophisticated. And that sort of, you know, goes somewhat to the level of, of what you were talking about in terms of intuition. So I don't think, I mean, I really, um, I don't want to sound dismissive about it, but I mean, I really don't think we are um, any, any way close to, to sentient androids. I mean, completely sentient androids who, who can act and operate like humans is, you know, decades away. Um, and I might be completely wrong on that, but I mean, I don't, I don't see it within the life, my lifetime or my children's lifetime. Thank you. Thank you. All the, it's been fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. And by the way, I'll, I'll send the, um, um, I'll post the, the presentation on, on a Dropbox. It's, it's very large given all the videos, unfortunately, so it might take a while to download. But um, for those of you who want to pick up the URLs and, and just dig into the, some of these, um, these websites in a bit more detail on your own time, um, I'll, I'll make that available. Thank you. Robin, I see you to... opened your microphone again. Robin? Yes, I'd like to pick up something that Stefan just said. You said that a completely sentient android is decades away. Now I've lived for nearly 80 or more than 80 decades and things that seemed only a few decades away when I was 40 are now a reality. Perhaps you should alter that phrase to only decades away. <laughs> Uh, I mean, Robin, it, it's a, it is a fascinating debate. I mean, I think if you, if you read the books on, on AI at the moment, you know, there's sort of a, um, there's one, one stream of people that, that say, you know, artificial general intelligence is maybe, you know, 60 years away. There are other people that say it's a hundred. I mean, it's a, it's a slightly, I mean, to be honest with you, you are right. You can't, you can't really predict anything in technology more than 10 years out. Right. Um, I think the, I think the, the point is that if, you know, if humans could have, could have imagined it, which they've kind of been doing in science fiction for many years, um, the reality is that at some point it actually does become, or we, we start do, we, we, we start to approximate it, right? But if you, but if you think about, I mean, robotics, particularly, if you think about it, it, it this, this dates back, you know, several centuries, the whole idea of the automaton, right? Which was a, a human fascination, you know, even, even before electricity. I mean, it was sort of a, you know, uh, the me mechanical automatons, um, you know, going back in history. And, and so, I mean, I do think this idea that, that of, of creating machines that approximate humans has been a, it's been a sort of a, you know, a, a couple of centuries long obsession of, of humanity, which I find actually existentially quite interesting. I mean, why, why would that be, why would that be something that we focus on as a, you know, as a species? Um, but regardless, I mean, it's, um, uh, there's nothing that I, that I can see right now. Even, even the stuff that Boston Robotics are doing, if you look at the, I mean, they're probably the most advanced robotics um, company at the moment. I mean, they're building machines that, that run and jump and, you know, kind of, um, you know, like humans or like dogs. Um, 
but they are they're programmed and they're running within within existing you know predefined systems and, and objective sets they're not they're not autonomous and they're certainly not sentient Stefan, it seems to be one Thank of you. the defense, defense mechanisms that we as humans can have to implement is to be distrustful, not to believe anything, not whether it be news, whether it be advertising, whatever, and just try and switch off or keep these things as far away from us as possible. I think, I think, I mean, I think there is a, um, there is a future where, where, you know, we, we have to, and this is sort of the point of the social dilemma as well. I think we have to recalibrate, you know. I mean, there's that, there's that wonderful, wonderful closing scene in, in the social dilemma where m my man, Euron Lanier, um, he, uh, he says, he says, you know, it's not the end of the world. And, and we just have to remember it's, it's, you know, lift your head up, look outside. It's beautiful out there. You know? And <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful reminder of the fact that all this kind of mediated existence, all this kind of like technology mediated existence is not, is not what life is all about. You know, I mean, it has been, it has created wonderful mechanisms, like for instance, that we can do this, right? I mean, 20 years ago, we couldn't do this. I, you couldn't see my face on a Monday morning over video conference in, in high definition. Um, it's meant that we can, you know, uh, you know, order things and get it, you know, two days later, you know, through a delivery van. It means that we can, you know, there, there, there are all kinds of things we can read text in different languages because it's being auto translated. I mean, there, there are many, there are many wonderful things that technology has done for us, but I do think um, future generations are going to have to be far more um, cognizant and, and I think trained in a different way to um, distinguish between what is real and what is not you know, um, what matters and what doesn't matter, um, you know, and, and as I said to you, I mean, I think it, it's, it comes, it comes with, it's a, it's a process of education. One has to, you have to really understand what's happening in, in order to understand the world that we're living in. And I think, um, I don't see our, our schools, certainly not here in the UK and probably not in South Africa either, you know, equipping our children at all to understand the world they're going into. Thank you. Anybody else? Stefan, this has been really wonderful. Thank you so much. You know, just a week ago, we had a panel discussion on education. And obviously, one of the issues that came up is educating for the future, with technology yeah. and all the uncertain future we're going into. But listening to you this morning, and the way you are able to explain these things, my conclusion is, from that and previous experience, to be able to express yourself language skills and creativity are far more important than content because with language skills and understanding that is the only way we can safeguard ourselves and our children to deal with the uncertain future i think and you really exemplified that this morning so thank you very very much and my close closing closing comment i mean that's the key thing um it's creativity it's the ability to to create um to, to come up with new problems to, or new solutions to all problems, the ability to solve new problems in, in creative, in, in you know, uh, innovative ways. I mean, that, that is the, that is the, the lasting differentiating skill set, I think. And um, I can't encourage, you know, my children more, more than I am at the moment to, um, to focus on that. Anyway. Mothers must have the last words. Barbara, any closing comments from you? I would say, I would like to say, yes, of course, I know what he thinks and he's told me many of these things before. But it just brought home to me again that in education, one has to be very careful what one teaches children. And to the people who decide what children are going to learn and what they're going to be exposed to are very, very important. And I don't know how we're going to manage that. Thank you. It was an excellent talk. Stefan, thank you very much. This was a most interesting and stimulating presentation. It really is a privilege to live in this world where technology makes it possible to communicate across the oceans. Thank you for your time. Thank you to everybody that participated this morning. Stay well. I'm going to close the meeting now. Goodbye.